Dr. Sabalovskaya, welcome to Yale. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for inviting me, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Uh, perhaps there is no need to introduce you to or most of us who had any relationship or connection to Vilnius in the last decades. Dr. Sobolovskaita is the author of uh, award-winning bestsellers. Uh, Silverarum, perhaps, are uh, those ones that many of us have written in the, read in the past. But, of course, on the top of that, Dr. Sobolovskaita is also a honorary citizen of Vilnius. So, and of course, you have very many hats, your historian of art, your, uh, your research and your uh, appearances in public uh, spaces in Lithuania have steered debate on issues that go far beyond uh, historical memory and collective memory. And I guess we'll t try to touch upon those topics in forthcoming conversation. I'm really excited to get started. I think inevitably we'll, we'll touch a lot of interesting subjects because Vilnius is the city that... Um, suggests uh, very interesting stories. And I think I will be telling you a lot of stories about Vilnius because that's what writers do, they tell stories. Of course, so let's have this 700 years old story. However, you know what Vilnius says that it's not 700 years old. What Go Vilnius Agency says that Vilnius is 700 years young. So we'll be in this, you know, um, uh, not in the perspective of uh, maturity of age, but also energy and ambition that Vilnius represents and let's get started with a bird's eye perspective let's zoom out of course zoom is something that is irritating these days but let's zoom out for a moment let's imagine that we're looking at Vilnius from a bird's eye perspective and uh, the Vilnius has been changing of course during these seven centuries but Dr. Sabalovskaita what has remained unique and unprecedented for Vilnius throughout these all uh, very different, very diverse centuries of Vilnius history. Well, well, well actually, I, the, the bird's eye view I explore in, my, in the opening of my second uh, part of the Silver Arum novel, when there's um, a crow watching what's happening in Vilnius. Uh, to put it at one sentence, what is unique and unprecedented in those 700 years? I would say the amount of talent and creativity that Vilnius gave to the world. I tried to um, compile a list of notable contributions to the uh, world of uh, arts, uh, music, uh, literature from Vilnius, but it's, it started becoming too long, simply. If you take the arts, okay, Vilnius has its own Baroque school of architecture, which is in every... Um, uh, every art history textbook. If we are talking about the history of art, um, Vilnius is actually the first place in um, Europe and in a way in, in a world where the art history has been taught as an academic discipline that was so new, that was before the German school of art. There was a certain British engraver, Jonathan Saunders, uh, who came to, came to Vilnius University at the end of the 18th century uh, um, uh, in, into the um, um, uh, department of um, um, art and architecture established by Franciszek Smuglevich, and he found the academic environment uh, so inspiring and so liberal that he started teaching a history of art for the first time in the world. Uh, Vilnius architecturally is uh, so beautiful that it probably, you know, just wakes up the creative uh, minds. Um, it's very musical also. Uh, I was uh, born in, in, in a building where Yasha Heifetz gave his first uh, concept, so it's also very personal. If we're speaking about the composers, then uh, uh, that building uh, stands of, um, on the um, avenue of Adam Mickiewicz. Again, Adam Mickiewicz and Vilnius University as this great, great hub uh, that has produced the um, uh, international bestsellers in literature starting from the 17th century. Uh, Mikhail Kazimierz Serbievsky, 
uh, now forgotten, but major force in the 17th century Europe, poet laureate crowned with laurels by the uh, popes of Rome and his um, his poetry, which has been re-released for, I think it, it had about 60 editions and it was international bestseller. So with, with, with Ash um there's Eliza Ozeshkova, who was uh, the candidate for Nobel Prize. There was um, Ignacy Kraszewski, major name for the post, Roman Gary. It's all Vilnius, 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 Vilnius. Why? Um, what is so... Um, unique and particular? I think probably the answer lies in a very simple thing. Um, we were the last pagans uh, of uh, Lithuania, and therefore when the Christianity um, uh, came, we were still very young and very new, you know, without the um, um, that that's what produced the huge religious tolerance. And one of my favorite kings and grand dukes of Lithuania, Sigismund Augustus, has proclaimed in the mid 16th century a phrase: "I won't be the king of your conscience." And what th this probably made Vilnius as the capital of Grand Duchy of Lithuania this major magnet for the religious refugees from all the countries who could fulfill themselves in an environment that was quite quite liberal, quite inspiring. Is that these are Vilnians who make Vilnius unique in that sense, and I think we'll touch upon many Vilnians in that regard and uh, touch of course centuries. But before we do so. I think those individuals who make Vilnius unique, of course, they are inseparable from the language they speak. Now, I was thinking, uh, I recently rewatched this renowned interview that Hannah Arendt gave to Gunther Gauss in the 60s. And when Gunther Gauss asks Hannah Arendt, so what remains eventually? Hannah Arendt responds, the language remains. And the question is, when we talk about the 700th anniversary of Vilnius, what is the language should we talk? Should we carry on the conversation in English? Should we find other forms of linguistic expression? What's your take on that? I, I think that uh, a true Vilnian is always a polyglot. That's uh, the main answer. I, I grew up in Vilnius, um, uh, speaking at home um, half, half Lithuanian, half Polish. On the street, inevitably, there was Russian because of the Russian occupation, and also in my um, in the courtiers of or courtyards of the old town and in my childhood, it was also Yiddish. I grew up uh, singing uh, Yiddish songs, so it was this melee of languages. I. 100% I can state for sure that I couldn't have written uh, Silver Realm or I could not write the way I write if not for the multitude of languages and the available sources because you, you can't read Vilnius just in one language. You will be missing out significant parts of its history, of its DNA, of its vibe. So Without without Polish, you won't understand the uh, the period from the 16th to the 18th century. Without the Russian, you won't um, understand uh, the Vilnius of the during the uh, Tsarist uh, occupation uh, uh, of the 19th century and the post-Soviet times. Without Lithuanian, you can't read the and understand the contemporary Vilnius. And without Latin, you won't. Um, you won't be able um, to familiarize yourself with the Vilnius University and its history, its, its main intellectual discourse. So, of course, on the top of that, we take Ruthenian, if we talk about the language of statutes. If... The, the first uh, book in Ruthenian was published in Vilnius, so it was uh, Francisco Scorina's uh, uh, publication. Right, indeed. Yet you mentioned this aspect of multitude of languages, right? And language, of course, it's not only about the, your verbal expression, it's not only about the school of thought that you're entertained, but also it's about sounds. And this multitude of sounds is a polyphony. We talk a lot about Vilnius as a, this polyphonic space, right? A space where different sounds and voices are heard. Now I'm wondering, is this the way how Vilnius has been from day one? Or when does this salience of polyphony 
has become became essentially inseparable from those. Is this from the very, you know, first days, first letters of uh, Grand Duke Gidiminas in you know, 1323? Or there is a certain moment when polyphony is not yet there, that it's something just on the margins, but not in the mainstream of Vilnius. When polyphony becomes the mainstream of Vilnius? I, I would say that since the first mention in the letters Grand Duke Gediminas, because, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the communication, it's the uh, invitation of uh, foreigners, of different groups uh, of people into Vilnius. Those were addressed towards the merchants in Germany and also the Jewish tradesmen, which was also very important. Uh, it was written in Latin by the uh, Latin uh, uh, fluent monks. Obviously, there's a melee of Ruthenian and uh, Lithuanian during that time as well. So we have from day one, probably as, as this, you know, hub, we have uh, quite... Um, uh, a few languages spoken. When, we, when I write my historical novels, for me, it's always the question to try and establish at which point my characters speak which language. And this is very fascinating because obviously students in the university, they speak Latin on the streets. Uh, Lithuanian language is very prominent because the, from the 17th century, there are very um, a multitude of mentions how um, the professors of rhetoric, such as uh, Sigmund Lauxman, for example, how they um, go to the city squares and they read their sermons in Lithuanian uh, language, the, the first dictionary of the Konstanty uh, Sirvit uh, uh, in Polish, Latin, and Lithuanian. So it's it's also very prominent, this ancient Lithuanian language. Uh, I think what is interesting about Vilnius, um, the title of the um, uh, Jerusalem of the North, it's not just solely for the prominent um, Jewish community. I think what is really important that, in fact, as a Jerusalem, uh, Vilnius is a city sacred for... Uh, for the multitude of confessions. And as Jerusalem, it has four distinct uh, confessional quarters. So it's Catholic, Polish, and Lithuanian. It's the German quarter, which is Lutheran, Protestant. It's Jewish, and it's Ruthenian. So that's what makes Vilnius the Jerusalem of the North, and which is fascinating. So let's stick for a moment with this distribution of local communities in Vilnius. Now, I am not a musician. Anyone heard me singing would just run away from this room. I'm not the one, though. There is a wonderful school of music here at Yale, but I would never fit for them. Yet what I know is that polyphony in music is inseparable from a choir, right? Choir is essential for polyphony actually to happen. And guess what? Earlier this year in the National Philharmonic Society in Vilnius, a new opera was uh, premiered, Sarabanda. And Dr. Sabolevskaya has written actually libretto for the choir. And I was thinking about this parallel between the choir and the city. And what I know, the choir are composed of different roles. There are sopranos, there are alts, there are, you know, uh, tenors, uh, there is a bass. So there are all sorts of different roles in the choir. Thinking about Vilnius as the choir, who would fit what? You just mentioned Lutherans, Orthodox, mm -hmm. Catholics. Karaites on the you know on the sub on 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 the borderland of Ishki, yes yes. So who would be who? Oh, that's that's a very good question uh, because huh. I've, I've been incredibly lucky because I left my tiny mark in three fields: in the history of art, in literature, and in in music. So I think I'm the luckiest person alive because to do that in one life is, is, is more than enough. Um, when I was writing the uh, lyrics uh, for the choir, I actually, the distribution of voices, I left uh, that for Gediminas Gelgotas, the composer. For me, the main issue was the language. In which language the choir should sing? Uh, and uh, Gediminas, he was, you know, at the beginning he was adamant because he's a very internationally um, recognized composer. He will be performing at Carnegie Hall on the 2nd of uh, December. So I invite uh, everything, uh, everyone to um, uh, go and see this um, uh, international 
the, this talent of international Kalba. Uh, but um, he was adamant, maybe we should do it in English because English is naturally the lingua franca of nowadays. And I said, no, we should do it in Lithuanian, but I will try and write the way that uh, even the person who is not fluent in Lithuanian would understand what it is about to use the register of the Lithuanian uh, language, which is very phonetic. It's great sounding. We have in our audience my favorite Lithuanian poet, um, Thomas Venslova. And when Thomas Venslova uses Lithuanian language, I always say that um, it's, it's in such a noble register of language that uh, you indeed can believe the legend that uh, Lithuanians um, derive from the Ro ancient Romans because it has this noble Latin sound. I tried to employ that in writing the, uh, the words for the chorus. Um, I wouldn't say that I would distribute to separate languages uh, certain voice uh, roles or registers. For me, the sound of Vilnius, the, the vibration, the musical vibration, and we came to the same, same conclusion together with Gediminas Gelgotas, is something even more innate. And I would say it, it's similar to Lithuanian polyphonic folk song Suteritina, uh, by which I'm saying that each language, um, the principle of Suteritina is that um, one voice starts, it's quite re repetitive, the other voice um, undertakes, undertakes it on top of the first voice, and it's like, like flowing. So, and you've, you have this mesmerizing musical effect when polyphony is at its best. Sometimes it could be different languages, different, uh, different voices, the tenors, altos, sopranos, bass, but you will have this universal vibration of Vilnius. And I hope we succeeded in achieving that. And one line of my words for the chorus is that in Vilnius, um, the nationalities disappear, only the humans remain. And Vilnius is a city that, um, uh, which has not enough love, but too much infidelity. That, that is an interesting take on that. Okay, uh, let's keep that at the back of my mind. I'll try, I'll try to get back in a second. Now, thinking about the diversity of local communities in Vilnius, let's take 17th century, right? We have Orthodox, we have uh, Greek Catholics, we have Catholics, we have uh, Lutherans, we have Jews, of course, we have Karaite and Muslims. There is a distinct confessional tradition. That's clear. There are distinct practices of daily life, of course. They live on different calendars, in fact. That's also remarkable. They speak different languages. They consume different food, different, uh, uh, different, uh, they, they, someone is merchant, others are dealing with other aspects of life. And they're all placed within these boundaries or just uh, across the boundaries of the city center. Yet, my question to you is, how do you see the nature of horizontal links that exist between these communities? How do you see that uh, happening in Vilnius? Let's take the time of Silver Adam, so 17th century, for example. Now, now I have to speak as a scholar. So I, I, I would find the term of community quite problematic applying uh, retrospectively to Vilnius. Because uh, what uh, are we considering to be the community? We have the social classes which are very clear. We have aristocracy, we have the clergy, we have the townsfolk, we have the peasants, and also we have uh, the, um, let's say, horizontal groups that are confessional. How those 
two axes intersect. What, what are we talking about? So I would be very cautious about uh, when talking about the communities in the 17th century. For me, what was for me the revelation, of course, all the answers you can always find at the historical sources. And who has done this, you know, great job with the 17 historical sources? It's David Frick and his book um, about 17th century, uh, Vilnius, Kithkin, and Neighbor. And that's amazing. He took one document, the visitation of uh, 1633, when the royal court came to Vilnius. Every house had to be registered to establish uh, the possible lodgings for the royal court. And on that basis, he explored the confessional and also the social class relationships in Vilnius. What is amazing, what is unique about Vilnius that Frick um, expressly proves and comes to conclusion, and you cannot argue with it, that the interpersonal relationships overrule the social class and even the uh, confessional divisions of that town. And there are things quite amazing and quite unimaginable in other cities. For example, a Lutheran uh, is inviting a Catholic as a godfather. Ruthenian plays as a godmother uh, to a Catholic. So um, uh, the 17th century uh, Catholic bishop issues uh, uh, an edict, a law, uh, expressly telling the, uh, that no one uh, can interrupt or interfere with the Jews celebrating their religious festivals. So it's, it's this coexistence that is based on the uh, neighborhood on completely interpersonal relationships. And I find it amazing, and I find that uh, indeed the DNA of Vilnius up to this date. This picture that you just described, it's, it truly sounds idyllic, but do you think that we can trace this uh, evolvement, the impact of this uh, horizontal interrelationship with different groups until these days? Is it so? Is the interpersonal relationship the dominant uh, driver of relationship or rather still those horizontal and vertical structures that impact the character of involvement of the city? Uh, uh, yes and no. Uh, if, if we are talking about um, um, the Vilnius of today, of course, uh, the interesting thing that Vilnius starts to remind the capital of the grand Duchy of Lithuania uh, once again because of the influx of refugees from Belarus and from Ukraine, people who are escaping the war and the uh, repressions by the authoritarian regimes. And we hear more and more, uh, you know, uh, Belarusian and Ukrainian language on the streets. So, uh, I think it, it's it's very important um, uh, to uh, somehow to overcome the language barriers. Then those in, interpersonal relationships can flourish once again, and we witness that usually the the, the barrier in communication, language communication, is what it makes um, difficult to understand the other. Uh, to find the, the, the contact and to establish those close inter, interpersonal relations, which I wouldn't agree that they were all, always idyllic. No, they were, they were you know, uh, the, the neighbors' relations. Neighbors sometimes quarrel and they sometimes have, you know, quite uh, different views on the same thing or how, you know, one staircase should be uh, cleaned and, and managed, so. 
Um, <clears throat> now, when I think about Vilnius, I was born in Vilnius. My my parents born in Vilnius. My grandmother was born in Vilnius. Uh, when I think about uh, my hometown, I inevitably link it to a very profound dialogical place. Let's say there is a flourishing urban life, yet surrounded by a very dense forest. Even today, half of the Vilnius is covered by forest. This is perhaps what makes Vilnius also a great uh, place to become European green capital. When I look at the architecture, of course, this is a fascinating, mesmerizing Baroque architecture, yet placed in the Gothic structure of the city, which Professor Wenzel has vividly described in a number of his books, how that coexists all together. When I also think about the history of Vilnius, right, this is the seat of the Grand Duke, but also this is the seat of a bishop, two very different sources of authority. So there is, to me at least, it seems dialogue is everywhere in Vilnius. What do you think is the role of dialogue? in the villains because communities interact also in the form of dialogue or maybe sometimes uh, it's a polylogue i don't know what what does dialogue resemble i, to I don't, don't think this is always the case because i just you know uh, before coming here to you to you i reread uh, one uh, great dialogue between uh, professor thomas Venslova and cheslov milos and Chelos, cheslov milos expressly says that um remembering uh, his student years um, that uh, there was no dialogue between the Polish-speaking Vilnian uh, community and the Jewish community. And he says, we have no idea. So many fascinating things are taking place in the Jewish community, all the uh, poetry in Yiddish. He only found out about uh, uh, this, you know, well after the World War II. Um, indeed, very interesting that Milos in Vilnius during his student years, sometimes he felt alien. Uh, there's this passage when he observes um, the uh, parishioners of St. George Church. This was my family parish church gathering uh, for the you know Sunday mass, and he feels alien. It says, "Oh, this is Vilnius creme de la creme." Okay, my family wasn't creme de la creme of Vilnius, but they had three very beautiful daughters. Especially one was uh, well well known in in um, Vilnian society for that time. So Milos probably saw my family, and he felt that this is a separate world to which he does not belong. I have the insider um, knowledge of that world, all the family tales about the bulls, the social life, uh, uh, affairs, and so on, and so on. So, so this is a different part of Vilnius. So Vilnius is not always dialogical. I think Vilnius is more like, uh, like the city of those lost, poetic, tormented souls. I think in a way you are always alone in Vilnius and that's what what makes a city a city. You are always alone in the city. If you are in a small community, if you are in a village, you are in a community. And Vilnius as a town, it's I'm afraid it's 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 not very common. This is an interesting perspective indeed. Um yeah, I think the sense of alienation and your belonging to the place and yet trying to identify who can you relate to, right, in this uh, uh, eventful life of a city, yet trying to identify the place to your own, yes. For, for me, I think the, the major uh, text uh, with which I identify personally. Well, my, my family has its roots uh, recorded in Vilnius since mid 18th century, one, one side of my family. And when I read literature about Vilnius, prose, poetry, the one thing that I completely identify with, the feeling um, of you being alone in the city, contra mundum. I think, after all, it's, it's Roman Gary, La Promesse de l'Aube, Promise at Dawn. And uh, sometimes the city can be quite brutal, 
the interactions in the city can be quite, you know, un unfriendly, intimidating, and so on. But when that little boy, uh, at the darkest hour of his life, stands in the one of the courtyards of Pokolanka, and suddenly a cat appears and start, starts licking the little boy's face, so this is you and Vilnius. For me, this is, I think, the, the paramount text that uh, vibrates. And another thing is always um, the little Mr. Pekelne, who lives at number 16 in Pohulanka. Some nobody person uh, who at a crucial point in your life demonstrates this warmth and this, you know, profound human relationship that makes you, uh, whenever you find yourself afterwards at the court of the uh, Queen of England or uh, in front of Charles de Gaulle or the mighty of this world, that makes you still want to tell the story of little Mr. Pekelne. I had a similar person in my life, and that was uh, a tiny Jewish lady, our neighbor Basse. So she is the, my equivalent of Mr. Pekelne. And I think that my mission uh, uh, tell, when telling stories about Vilnius, uh, not only focus on the beautiful architecture, the great cultural achieve achievements, music and arts, but first and foremost, foremost on the invisible people of the city, because the city consists of people. Just reflecting about the story on Roman Gari and thinking in broader terms, even for example, about the Litvaks of Vilnius, right? The Jews of Vilnius. I, I believe that the heroic lens is often applied, right? We think about Litvaks of Vilnius, we think about Jack Lipschitz, we think about Chaim Sutin, we think about the most renowned artists like Yasha Heifetz and others, right? So this heroic lens is helpful in trying to explain Vilnius by those individuals and personalities, right? Heroes they sound like a, an accelerating power to the to the resonate villains, right? Is there any conflict between those individual heroes and the communities that they are somewhat representative of? Uh, I are they in a tight relationship, or they rather these heroes emerge as a conflict within community, or they are opposite to the community? What what do you think about this relationship of a hero and a community? I I, I think what uh, what. Uh people of Vilnius, the great creators uh, from Vilnius or uh, the creators have been uh, sort of, you know, honed and forged in Vilnius University and Academy of Fine Arts, as, as you've mentioned, Haim Sutin, who I, whom I love very much and I, his work resonates with the, you know, this profound feeling of, of Vilnius, of this um, introspection, a certain cynicism. So what we bring to the world arts, I think Vilnius is, is a very dramatic and tragic city. And we usually bring uh, the sensitivity. It's whether it's Yasha Heifetz, whether it's um, um, Haim Sutin or Richardus Gavalis or the poetry of Thomas Venslova, I think would bring this open nerve, which resonates in a wider context. When you were describing your childhood in Vilnius, you talked about the presence of many languages that surrounded you, right? You, you're you're, you're well-versed in different languages too you're able to interact with those different spoken traditions. And that's the uh, very common framework of reference to Vilnius, right? a city where you hear so many languages. My problem with that is that when I, and I don't want to sound too pretentious, but when I talk to young people, 
I do not always hear from them a capacity to speak any languages other than their mother tongue, most of the time Lithuanian, and English. And that's it. Hardly you can find any teenager these days or like anyone, you know, 20 ish years old who would be versed in Polish, in Belarusian, in I don't know, Yiddish for that sake, right? And one can easily explain why so, but yet at the same time, realizing that ability to express yourself, to navigate yourself profoundly in different linguistic environments has been at the core of Vilnius. I even, uh, Vice Mayor just talked here about the system of education. Well, there is lots of innovations. Mayor Bloomberg is supporting some of them. That's great. That's terrific, right? That's, that's, that's incredible. Yet at the same time, when I look in the list of public schools in Vilnius, at the second, third foreign language taught that, yeah, Jesuit high school is great. They teach German really well. I look at Vilnius Lyceum, they're really smart kids there. Perhaps Jermune High School, some of the rest, but that's, that's it. Most of the time, they, everyone thinks English is just now these days. Therefore, I might sound controversial, but isn't that that at this moment, Vilnius actually is least multilingual in the la original language that the mother tongue, that it, Vilnians are able to speak, or that's just my confused uh, imagination. I can give you one advice. Go to one of the children's playgrounds in the old town in Vilnius, whether the um, Rudninke Square or near St. Catherine's Church, and you will see amaz amazing things. You will see the uh, little children who speak French and seamlessly um, transfer their conversation into Russian or Polish or Lithuanian or English. So you have, you know, again, when I see this and when I experience this, as the, oh, this is true Vilnius spirit. The problem is it's not, um, it's not uh, being carried out into our education system. That's the problem. But, you know, uh, our education system, in my opinion, uh, leaves a lot to improve. So I, I think it, it should be only natural that every Lithuanian um, would be fluent in the neighboring languages, Polish or Latvian. So, you know, we, we are very talented people and uh, the, the potential I see young people, especially in children, is amazing. So we should teach them more languages. You were referencing to Vilnius as if a new becoming, you know, or fulfilling its role and capacity as capital of Grand Duchy of Lithuania, because quite recently, so in the last three years, we uh, we had an influx of Belarusians, of Ukrainians searching for, in the seeking for, you know, shelter from political oppression. Um, if you look at the statistics, it says that there are over 60,000 Belarusians, let alone having residence permits in Lithuania, most of them, of course, based in Vilnius, 80,000 Ukrainians, again, most of them based in Vilnius, uh, close to 20,000 Russians, and many of them too, in fact, searching for political shelter as well. Uh, again, most of them based in Vilnius. So that, that's great, that, that diversifies you know, the spectrum of communities in Vilnius. But what also happens to that, Vilnius is growing demographically. Uh, former Mayor Shmash has just mentioned a few, few months ago, a year ago, that Vilnius finally has surpassed Riga in terms of its population. Never before, I believe so, Vilnius was able to surpass Riga in terms of its population, at least when we talk about the 20th century. So what do you see there about this fact? Is that an opportunity that Vilnius, or rather it's a threat? Maybe it destroys and ruins the charming uh, atmosphere of this you know, tiny little city in the forest? You, you, you know, being a true arrogant Vilnian, I, I sort of never, you know, um, check my caliber towards the Riga, Riga. I think Vilnians, they usually, you know, they dream about Paris, Warsaw, New York, uh, Rome, and their imag imagination is, you know, to achieve things and prove for themselves there, you know, with the world capitals. Uh, not facing somewhere north or east. I think that's that's the problem. Uh, uh, the growth of population. Again, I think that um, um, it's a great opportunity for Lithuania. 
uh, and what we should do, I think we should make um, uh, the, those goodwill people who are uh, escaping the repressions, we should make them very welcome in Vilnius and um, also integrate them in, in terms of language. So my, my latest uh, crusade will be to lobby um, for Lithuania to invest in Duolingo. The basic, you know, the easiest way to learn Lithuanian for Belarusians, Ukrainians, and so on, and to, to encourage everyone to be very welcoming uh, to those who learn Lithuanian language. And I think that it, it will be also the great opportunity for those refugees who, who find the temporary shelter in, in Vilnius. In recent years, and even in this year, you were an active member of some of grassroots campaigns happening in Vilnius, protecting, for example, some of its, uh, you know, natural environment, uh, including on Pohulanka Street, right, on Basnauchi Street. And there are many more campaigns with grassroots movements that emerge in Vilnius when it comes to cultural heritage, when it comes to other causes. Uh, do you see these as a somewhat sporadic individual happenings? Or rather, there is a greater civic awareness of Vilnius being responsible for the city, not only enjoying the city, which we all do, of course, whenever we go to Vilnius, in, in the nasty weather, we still enjoy Vilnius, right? But is there a sense of greater responsibility that Vilnians are nurturing in recent decades? Um, when I debuted uh, with my first Silvarerum novel in 2008, uh, there were just a few books uh, on Vilnius. Uh, there was a long sold out um, album The Lost Vilnius by Vladas Drema. There was a great uh, guide of Vilnius by Thomas Venslova. And that very same year, uh, two books simultaneously at the same time came out. Laimonas Briedis, Vilnius City of Strangers. Laimonas is present here in the audience. So it's a great book. I could recommend it to everyone. And my Silver Room. So I think Laimonas raised the awareness of the uh, point of view towards the Vilnius from the international audience and, uh, you know, the, the mapping, the, the historical DNI, and I threaded the path that only the prose and the fiction literature can thread, appealing somehow to emotions. Uh, Fifteen years on, each year, amazing number of titles on Vilnius. Popular, uh, popular history, fiction, um, you know, books dedicated to some particular quarters or historical periods of Vilnius are coming out. So there's plenty of interest now. And I know people um, for example, they buy a new flat in Vilnius and in the old town or in the central part, what they do first and foremost, they try to find about the history of their building, who lived there, uh, what, and, and they feel like they are the carriers of the tradition. I, and I think that's what makes you attached to the place and what makes you a citizen of Vilnius, the knowing of history. The realization that you are not just, I don't know, some user of, of the town, but that you are the keeper of, the, of it. And that you are just, you know, one link in this uh, chain that of, of citizens that goes throughout the history. And the, that after you will die, you have to pass further the city unspoiled, preserved. Uh, you just mentioned the word citizen, and I'd like, as a final question, to I'd like to touch upon that more profoundly. In this room, we have two honorary citizens of Vilnius, Professor Venslova and Dr. Sipolovskaita. You, Dr. Sipolovskaita, have become the 21st honorary citizen of Vilnius, so this is a very, very short list. 
it's a list of very distinguished people, among them presidents uh, like Valdez Adamkos, uh, President Shimon Peres, uh, of course, Professor, late Professor Czesław Miłosz and others. But you are now the most recent honorary citizen of Vilnius. What makes you proud to be a Vilnian today? First of all, I will be completely, you know, immodest. And I would say that I'm really proud that I became the first woman citizen and I felt like I broke the glass ceilings because the contribution of women to to the city and to preserving the city tradition is immense. Uh, first of all, they are the carriers of the family traditions and family memory and we cannot underestimate this. So I felt you know really privileged collecting this um honorary citizenship in the name of all the women of Vilnius and of course of my grandmother, my mother and lo lots of other women and the, the rest the rest is hard work <laughs> there's nothing glamorous about being a honorary citizen of Vilnius it's, it's this um, I think this constant urge a constant, uh, you know, burden of having to fight for your city, you know, to 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 stop some, you know, uh, crazy or damaging initiatives, uh, to spread the word. You are not always popular. Sometimes you you instill you, you see some sometimes you know very true but unpopular things then you have you know backlash towards you so it's it's a duty Sobolowskaite this is the duty that you carry on very well we are proud to have you again here and thank you for this wonderful conversation